Welcome back, dear audience. Uh, I hope you got a bit of a leg stretch there, maybe a cup of coffee. Uh, so, Pipsa, the yeah. menti results. Let's see them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. That's very nice. Uh, that's very nice for us to know that you found this session interesting. Also very good, informative. Some found it also a bit frustrating, but maybe it's the topic and not the session itself. Uh, let's hope so. Um, yeah, I guess it's also complex um, and it's a lot of hard work um, to work with these issues. And people also got some uh, insightful thoughts um, and new learnings and found it inspirational. So. I, I think this sets us off in a nice way to the... Uh, yeah, um, to the Nordic tour. Mm. Yes, it's time for the Nordic tour. So now we'll hear from uh, a few uh, uh, local, uh, local examples uh, of inclusion in practice. And uh, if you have questions for these speakers, just put them again in the chat and we'll try to integrate them as I interview our upcoming guests. And our first trip goes to Iceland. <laughs> Oh, I really want to go to Iceland when I see that picture. And Hilma Holmfrider Sigurdardottir. I hope you're with us now. Uh, yes, you I live am. Oh, very Thank good. You. Good to see you, Hilma. Uh, Thank you, you live in Reykjanesberg, uh, very close to Keflavik Airport. So I, I believe That's that quite correct. a few in our audience have actually been to your municipality. You've had a, a quite uh, sharp increase in migration over the past 10, 20 years. And, and uh, you work a lot with with diversity and integration hands on in your project Alir Med so please tell us more about about your program Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this forum. Such an honor and thank you North Reykjö for looking at Reykjö Inspire in your research and work Here it is and Aosa, it's been a pleasure working with you I would like to tell you about the multidimensional and holistic society program called Atlir Med Atlir Med is, of course, the same as Allemet in the Scandinavian languages. In English, we would probably say everyone included or everyone on board. Atlir, Atlir Med is mm. first and foremost about children's well-being and good health. The target group being uh, children of uh, 7 to 15 years old. And you have a film to show us a bit of what your I work do. as well. I do. We yeah. show the film now. Thank you. So this is about the introduction, sorry, yeah. yeah, the introduction about all activities, sports and leisure, that is uh, to to act, to be active in, in our municipality and the importance to let people know what it is that is possible to, to train or, or, and participate in. Mm. What, what are the results you've seen so far? Do you see uh, that, that both children and their parents mix and mingle more with the, with the, sort of with the natives of, of Reykjavik and Esper? Yes, we've been working quite um, strongly towards that approach. Of course, we are in strange times now for inclusion and social particip participation when everybody is quite isolated and it's... It's the most difficult for this group we are talking about now. But in this program, Adler Med, we uh, plan and we do uh, coach uh, every coach and instructor that works with children uh, to develop their skill set uh, to support and strengthen children's positive communication and strong social skills. And that is the aim. It's positive communications and strong social skills for children. And all children are encouraged to participate in at least one organized activity and the focus being on the importance of belonging to a particular group of the society, a strong and healthy group that is monitored by a strong adult leader. Mm -hmm. So we start by 
by focusing on the leaders. Mm. And, and how do you manage, you say you, you uh, encourage uh, uh, children to join this group, but I, I'm just uh, considering if, if I'd come as a migrant to Iceland, how would I find out about the, these uh, activities for the kids? Or how, how, do, you, how do you reach out and, and ensure that everyone actually participates? Mm-hmm. Adler Mel is a, is a new new program in, in Reykjanesbær and it was the architecture of the program was was uh, built this uh, spring semester in COVID first wave and we did not see this November 2020 for us. So, um, but what we are doing is to strengthening the coaches, the leaders and introducing the the activities that we have and and co-op cooperating with the schools mm-hmm. where the children are to let them know uh, what what it is that they can do and to support them to participate so they do belong to a strong um, and healthy group. I, I know you work with the parents as well and, and I know that the Polish migrants are a huge uh, minority group but that you also have uh, many different nationalities. Could you say a few words about, about the, the outreach to the sort of the adult uh, population as well and, and, and are, the, are the natives interested in also making new friends? Uh, that is one of the challenges is the awareness factor and it takes time and energy and, and to be honest I often wonder if it's worth spending time on mm-hmm. uh, when we could perhaps put more time and focus on teachers coaches and leaders but the answer I always get to is yes we have uh, received new partners cooperating with us due to our positive presentation and awareness raising and then we all of course aware make parents aware and and that is our focus group parents and the 1000 staff members of Reykjanesbær mm. and we will keep that focus alive and even do more of that that sounds very promising. And for all of you in the audience, also please uh, have a look in, in this report that Mats and Sander presented. Reykjanesbær is one of the cases featured, so that will also tell you more. And of course, people can also reach out directly to, to Hilma after the program if you join the, the Zoom meet and mingle. Thank you. I Thank will. you Thank so you. much. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Hilma. Uh, all right. Our second trip goes to Norway. So very welcome Lisbeth Iversen. You are the project manager of Medhjerte för Arendal, uh, so uh, Arendal kommune in Norway. And you've worked for several years now uh, with with this program. And a key concept is what you call the asset-based community development. Please tell us, give us some flesh and blood to this concept. What does it mean in practice? Well, it means that you look at something, maybe a challenge, and you search for the opportunity. Um, People do not really want to co-create on challenges and problems and disasters and disabled. And they want to be part of something that is possible to to do. So asset-based community development is looking for the resources, the people, the potential buildings we can make activities in, uh, how we can change the attitude and maybe develop a care for each other culture and not only looking at physical infrastructure but also the culture Mm. of how we co-create. And you you focus a lot on your uh, migrant population as a resource for the community. Could you give us a few examples? How do you uh, how do you sort of develop this uh, this resor- resource? And uh, it, it has to do with employment and education, I'm sure. Yes, uh, it has to do with linking both top down, you know, legal plans and things like that, initiatives coming from the municipality with needs and, and uh, initiatives from the local community and individuals. So very specifically, we have a ongoing movement where we facilitate meetings around lunch on several times a year, different places inside, outside where we invite people that has been living for a long time in Arendal 
to meet newcomers from different nations. And this has become a very important foundation for the co-creation. We get to know new people we didn't know existed and we just talk. So that is a very practical foundation for our year long work. Mm. Uh, but also we look at specific challenges like safety and uh, well-being in the city center and we look for the young people who maybe make a little trouble. Maybe they could be role models and we could hire them during the summer to make activities in the different public places. And this summer we had a collaboration with the businesses and uh, shops so we could actually uh, use each other's knowledge about things and also make the young people shine. And the criminality went down and the activity went up in safe COVID-19 regulations because the young people were hired also to look for the best way of uh, doing activities and telling people to keep distance and, and be polite and say hello. And the next uh, level, I think, when, uh, when we look at it, is this holistic planning approach mm -hmm. where we have now co-created an overall municipal plan and try to downscale uh, the sustainability goals to the local context. And the politicians gave half of the places in the steering group for this plan to the civil society. And you're including young people there as well then in, in this uh, sort of future development of Arendal. Yes, very much. And uh, I think we are talking a lot about how we can get out of our office and search for the silent voices or people who are not usually coming to public meetings. Mm. So we have been, I have been visiting a prison, talking to young people there. We have also discussed with young people with no formal education, you refugee background, and ask them about these uh, sustainability goals. And we had translators to help us so we could get the voices into the plan and the goals. Uh, but also the mayor and deputy mayor visited all the, the schools, uh, eight, nine grade and so on, and invited mm -hmm. after that two of each uh, students of each school to co-create in a workshop about what it meant for them to talk about sustainability in Arendal. And it changed the plan. Mm -hmm. We had well, other goals. Lovely. To focus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because it sounds, sounds easier said than done to actually reach out uh, specifically to youth who are, uh, you know, within some or showing some asocial behavior or being in criminality or whatever. But you, ma you say you're, you've actually managed to, to, to uh, empower these people in a different way and, and engage them in, in a positive development. Um, yes, we have to build trust and, and work with them over time. You know, nothing is a quick fix, mm. but we really need to ask for them mm. and to ask what they think about and what they know about the city or the city center or different areas where we maybe have some challenges mm. and they have a lot of competencies. Mm. So uh, um, over time, they we build trust. Mm. We have to work together and walk together. Mm. And what I'm saying is that we have this proximal individual uh, approach. We have this uh, practical approach to solve something specific yeah. Yeah. together. And we have the overall planning approach where we need to be thinking holistically and balance the power in that planning process. Mm. Thank you so much, Liz, but I think this is truly inspirational. And uh, and uh, for anyone who wants to know more, you mm -hmm. can just uh, Google uh, or look at our event page for Medhjerte for Arendal. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, see everyone as a resource. Mm, we actually you have, have a specific question as well. Yes, uh, relating to, one. Yeah. to this one. Um, uh, that uh, Someone from the audience would like to know a little bit more about uh, more details about the co-creation in your projects. Could you briefly elaborate on that? Yes, I will just shortly say that things takes time and I'm the leader of a network that is actually built up between the municipality, business, culture, uh, organization and individuals and also research in Arendal. So it's more than 150 organizations and actors and we meet three to four times a year to discuss and to share wh what's happening in the city and in the region, uh, who knows anything, 
who can do something and how can we collaborate. Uh, so co-creation really means you need to m design an infrastructure, if you see, mm. for meetings on a regular basis, like a knowledge arena where you share information and decide to take responsibility together. Mm. So it's uh, Thank not... You. I'm sorry, it. yeah, <laughs> we're running Thank out you. of time here. But Thank you again. I think this is a s very solid approach and the long term perspective is there and also uh, really uh, involving all these different actors and, and specifically look at, at your uh, population as an asset for development. Thank you so much, Lisbeth. Uh, so our next trip goes to Finland. Welcome, Antti Kurvinen. You are a po postdoc researcher at Tampere University, and I know you've spent quite a few years uh, researching uh, but the classification of housing uh, in Finland, but also the proactive social mix housing policy in Helsinki, for example, that actually Mats mentioned earlier in our Q&A session here. So, so uh, Antti, uh, perhaps you could uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on this social mix policy, the pros and cons, and do you see it as a sustainable model for the future that other Nordic uh, countries and cities uh, should learn from? Thank you, Osa. It's great to be a part of this seminar. And, and um, actually, the majority of Finns live in owner-occupied housing. But if we now focus on the Finnish rental market, so it is good to understand that the nature of Finnish rental housing market is dualist, by which I mean that there is a non-controlled rental market for privately funded housing and, and a separate rent regulated market for state subsidized housing stock. And uh, the state subsidized housing stock is largest in big cities. And, and some 30% of this subsidi subsidized housing stock is located in the capital region. And, and in 2017, the total state subsidized housing stock was around 13% of the entire housing stock in Finland and then 36% of the rental housing stock in Finland. And, and when talking about Finnish state subsidized housing, it is important to understand that it is subject to tenant selection and rent regulation. And, and these include restrictions on its purpose of use, conveyance, and, and uh, tenant selection and rent setting. And, and the aim of these restrictions is to keep state subsidized housing in rental use to secure its allocation for those whose housing situation is the most urgent and, and to maintain the cost of housing um, at an affordable level. And, and regarding tenant selection, the government confirms the tenant selection criteria annually. And, and, and the main principle for tenant selection is that the dwellings involved should be rented to those whose need is most urgent. Mm -hmm. And today, urgency is evaluated based on the applicant's housing need, capital and level of income. And, and priority is given to homeless and low income households with limited means. Uh, but at the same time, an expedient social mix at the building level and a socially balanced neighborhood are among the targets. And, and, and even if income is considered as part of the selection criteria, there are no strict income limits. And, and in addition to tenant selection, the law also regulates the setting of rents in, in, in state subsidized housing. And, and this rent setting is based on so-called absorption principle, uh, which, which means that rents should cover the costs, but um, corresponding to non-profit principles should not produce notable yields. And, and even if state subsidized housing is an inherent part of the Finnish housing system, uh, the Finnish housing subsidies are not restricted to the sub supply side, but demand side subsidies are also a central part of the system. And, and, and unfortunately, we don't have time to go into details here, but I, I would <laughs> still like to bring up some important aspects regarding the, uh, these two different types of housing subsidies. And, and, and the first one is that it's good to pay attention that uh, the fact that some 40% of Finnish 
uh, or housing allowances are paid to households who already uh, live in state subsidized housing. And, and as a result, it is not credible to claim that state subsidized housing would eliminate the need of tenant based subsidies totally, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that the proponents of state subsidized housing tend to do. And, 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 and the second one is that the cost of tenant based subsidy is more transparent than it is in state subsidized housing production. And, and that's why state subsidized housing production is easily perceived to be a less expensive form of support mm. than it actually is. Mm. But but and how I'm would you say, I mean, uh, from the, from a government point of view, I mean, and the sustainability here, it, it sounds like a rather expensive and ambitious policy, of course, uh, probably really benefiting the, the sort of the weakest or the most vulnerable on the on the housing market. But do, do you see that this this model is here to stay or where do you think uh, uh, Finland is going uh, the, the coming years? Uh, the, the system has very really strong support. As I said, there are a lot of proponents and, 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 and um, uh, it's very inherent part of the Finnish housing system. And I, I see that it, it will be there in the future, too. It, it's like um, there has been less uh, state subsidized housing production and, and, and the trend has been towards um, tenant based subsidies. But still, uh, uh, it's hard to see that the system would kind of totally change. Uh, so it has its place definitely, and and it's like um, and, and and now it's used pretty wisely that the kind of they are mixing new neighborhoods so that um, uh, the land use planning is requiring that twenty five percent, for example, is re required to be state subsidized housing, mm -hmm. and, and 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 that kind of applications are are pretty uh, sensible to use, and 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 they really make sense, but. Uh, of course, mm. it's kind of problematic if, if we mm. kind of uh, try to develop the um, uh, those um, housing estates, which uh, Matt already mentioned in, in his presentations mm. earlier. So, uh, which were uh, built in the 1960s and 70s. So, the, um, uh, it, it's uh, hard to achieve that kind of mix yeah. in those areas because yeah. the tenant selection it, it doesn't work that well because households who could contribute uh, to the objectives of a uh, kind of uh, social mix they don't do not they seek to relocate there. to these yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and, but, and uh, on the but, other hand uh, sorry we have a uh, kind of limited time do you see do you see uh, the danish style of demolition happening in finland or would that not happen in a finnish uh, suburb from the 60s short mm, answer uh, I, <laughs> Uh, yeah, little by little, there has been more demolished buildings as well. So really? we'll see how it will be. But uh, it, it, it has not been too common mm. yet. But the kind of uh, the kind of uh, smaller buildings have been replaced with uh, bigger ones. So basically, it's uh, kind of uh, developing those areas so that they demolish the old ones and, and, and mm -hmm. build new ones, which are bigger and more attractive. Kind okay. of if, if there are renovation uh, renovations that would be really expensive or something like that, so mm. it might be wiser to replace it with a total new building. Okay. Well, this is super interesting. And as you could all tell, uh, this is a, a complex issue as well. Uh, but Antti, it's it's also, of course, possible to meet you in the in the meet and mingle session on Zoom after after our official program here today. So to hear more uh, from Finland. But thank you so much for for being part of the program today. Thank you, Antti. Thank you uh, very much. All right, so our uh, final trip for the tour now goes to the north of Sweden. Hello and welcome, Ali Ababna, you're a representative of Haparanda Tornio, uh, working, uh, working uh, with the cross-border collaboration to create an inclusive city in, uh, well, in two dimensions, you could say, right? It, you're, you're, you're working with, uh, with the inclusiveness that we've already discussed today, but also, of course, with the cross-border dimension and trying to get rid of this border. Uh, I also know, I think you're a great example of inclusion yourself, right? I know you happen to be a native of, of Jordan from the beginning. But anyway, very welcome. And please tell us more about, about the vision, Haparanda 2035, and, and uh, your work ahead. 
Uh, thank you also for having me and uh, thank you again for the introduction. Actually, we can't remove the borders, but we hope that we forget about it. Mm -hmm. So we in Haparanda and Haparanda Antonio uh, are trying to work together as much as possible. And part of our vision is actually to remove the, the borders in all possible meanings, but not in a political meaning. In a way that we are aiming at trying to include to create what can be called an inclusive border area or inclusive border cities where all services where all activities where all possible kind of um, housing planning and the future planning can come together from both sides of course that can be complicated in a way or another because we're still talking about different different countries talking about different re national regulations but Haparanda and Antonio have decided to try to work together as much as possible and try to for to force more and more strategies and planning toward the future and part of that is is Haparanda's new vision, which is Haparanda 2035, uh, uh, which basically uh, a new vision for the coming 15 years that was built, established from the first step to the end by the people living in Haparanda and big portion of the majority who lives on, on the Finnish side. Uh, why imp it's important for us to include everyone? not only Haparanda, also Tornio. It's very important when we think how we plan, how, who to include, what to do, what is important to do, which sides we should take care, how do we prioritize our, our, our work here in, in Haparanda. We have to look at both sides as there are majority of people who works uh, in, who lives in Finland, in, in Tornio, works in Haparanda and the same. There are a big portion of people who lives in Haparanda, works in Tornio, so that's why it's very important that uh, we look at everyone and we think that the both sides are one when we, when we consider and think and we plan. Haparanda New Vision aims at uh, trying to be, actually we, we look at three different dimensions. The first one is try to activate and work for real on what is called a meaningful and active participation. That's why uh, the vision was built from A to Z, from feedback, participation, discussions with, um, with, uh, with the citizens of Haparanda Antonio. The second part was uh, is actually to think that we want to be a city or a border area for everyone, where everyone can be whoever they want, they can decide to do what they want with the support of both sides and with the support of the city. And the last part that we aim to be more sustainable and climate smart society uh, within the coming 15 years. So uh, this is a very uh, ambitious and, and holistic uh, strategy, uh, as it sounds. Uh, w would you mention a few examples? Like how would you do to, to uh, promote or encourage more, more businesses, uh, so uh, for example, to in invest in Haparanda Tornio? Or how would you work with people to, to make sure that they feel that they have all these opportunities that you want them to feel? Yes, so I, I can start uh, maybe with a, with a short uh, uh, piece of info that maybe not all, all of our audience knows where Haparanda or Haparanda Tornio in the map. So it will be interesting if you can look at that so you can see how far north we are. <laughs> so ch Very far are, from Jordan. <laughs> yeah, very, very far from Jordan. So our the challenges in this part of the of the world or in this part of the Nordic area is really more complicated and it, inf it added more challenges to, to compare to other to other sides of Sweden, for example. So what we are trying to do is first, why we cooperate is because we have limited resources. Why do we cooperate? Because we can't do a lot of things uh, ourselves. So for example, when we talk about now the situation with Corona, and when we talk about the lack of investments, and when we talk about the shortage and in, in resources in the, in the municipality, our, we try to emphasize that uh, a new kind of business approach where we try to deal with both sides mm -hmm. uh, strategies to work together. So our strategy to support the businesses is to build uh, a one strategy, one marketing strategy mm -hmm. 
for both sides. And that's why we have what we call now is two cities, one destination, which is how we sell ourselves to everyone. So we sell a unique product. We sell ourselves as a uh, as a one destination, though we are two different countries. We try to show what is unique about this place. We try to show how we can help more, what we can add more. In addition to that, we have created since... Um, uh, many years ago, what is called the Cooperation Council, which tries to uh, to to show and to sell and to try to mm -hmm. to market more how this uh, uh, this region or this area where borders like lies in the middle can create more opportunities than challenges. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do we do understand the challenges. Of course, we and don't COVID hide. And COVID is a big one, right? I mean, you have it's, new challenges now. Uh, it's it's i mean there is no way of describing the impact or the negative impact of covid on on the hapa Antonia region especially when the border between sweden and finland was mm -hmm. totally shut down or limited to border area uh, mobility the problem that happened uh, which might be uh, normal in border areas most of the shopping happening between the borders is is important mm. so for habaranda 70% of the shopping come is or the or the or the markets uh, is coming from finland oh, yeah. so when the borders closed that's like a disaster for habaranda mm. but also for for the finnish side for the tornio side they have main market where is important for us Hapar, who people who live in Haparanda. So we need the services available on the other side mm. because Tornio is relatively bigger than Haparanda. Mm. So it's the same. Yeah. So it, the impact is really is really strong. And to be honest, there are continuous discussion if this is going to stay for longer time, how bad the situation mm. can be and what additional solution can come and how we can try to, to find new uh, creative solutions yeah. To, to respond to this crisis, as we call it, it it is a bigger crisis maybe for us than uh, than than bigger cities with with uh, main res bigger yeah, resources. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ali. Of course, again, we would have liked to have more time and hear more about it. At least it sounds like you have a very solid uh, foundation for your collaboration, and I'm sure that you can, you know, definitely pick up and build on that further as soon as COVID has vanished whenever <laughs> that happens so i wish you all the best and and that you can sustain uh until that day thanks okay. again ollie for for contributing no uh very well um so uh, right now uh instead of of traveling further we're actually just going to talk to to uh, uh one of our nordic networks for uh inclusive cities uh and uh we have thomas Melin with us very soon and he represents the Swedish local agenda 2030 hub and uh, Thomas will uh, will describe a little further about you know why is it so important that cities engage in uh, in the topic of inclusiveness and also in the other uh, sustainable development goals and and what's the role of this specific uh, 2030 hub which actually has a direct link to the UN system and and is one of uh, a vast network of local hubs around our planet uh, that are working together and uh, cons constantly uh, exchanging experiences on how to to uh, uh, reach the su sustainable development goals uh, so uh, yeah and and it's it's primarily a Swedish network or a network for Swedish cities but you're also reaching out to to Nordic cities that are interested Thomas Melin, are you with us? I think I am with you. <laughs> That's <It's> very connected. <laughs> good. Very good. So please, uh, beyond my presentation here, what's what's really the aim of your hub and why are cities so important? Well, thank you very much for letting me be part of this very interesting networking event. I think that this is exactly what we want to have more of, exchange of best practices 
And uh, the hub system that you started to talk about, the fact is that the SDGs are now guiding the development all over the world, but they were created by the UN, which is really the United Nations. And now we realize that in order to implement what, what uh, the system says, you need more than nations. Mm. You need more than central government, you actually need local government. Uh, but the whole UN system has not really been developed in order uh, to interact with, with mm -hmm. local authorities. Uh, so they have created something uh, that they call Local 2030, which is a kind of a secretariat that is with the uh, General Secretary General's office in order to be freestanding from all the different UN agencies. And they are interacting with local authorities. The way they have done this, uh, it's like a five-year process now, is that they have set up hubs. And these hubs are of different types. Some of them are thematic and, and some of them are geographic. Uh, and some of them are very are, are pretty focused on, on certain things. But And we have then uh, been requested by the Secretariat in New York to actually create a Nordic or, or, or Swedish hub because we are looked upon from the outside as being fairly successful in the implementation of the SDGs here in this part of the world. And also we were very active when it came to the Agenda 21 and so forth. Mm. Do you think that's now, part of our success? Would you like to comment on that? What is it that makes uh, Nordic cities uh, successful when it comes to Agenda 2030 implementation? I think a lot of that has to do with all the experiences we have from Agenda 21. And I also think that we have a very good legal background in a way. We are very decentralized and the municipalities in, in, in Sweden have lots of decision making rights and they are responsible for important issues like education and health and so forth, which doesn't really maybe happen in, in, in other countries. So, so that is one, one, of the, one of the reasons, I think. But there is very many people, uh, municipalities and countries out in the world who knows that, that we are good examples mm. and they want uh, to come and talk to us. Mm. And I think that realizing that the SDGs have only another 10 years to be implemented, we have some kind of responsibility to actually share our experiences. Mm. But then they need a door to knock on. Mm. And this hub that we have created a, is a door for mm. the outside world to knock on, but it's also, a, a, what shall I say, a platform, a node for our own municipalities yeah. to uh, connect and support each other and, and bridge over sectors because mm. there is lots of networks and there is lots of contacts already but we this hub is is more kind of a, a network of networks in okay. reality so yeah. not a con not a construction of something new and yeah. expensive no, uh, I know that. I mean, you work with with uh, different uh, projects and initiatives uh, as well. More specifically, I, I know that youth involvement uh, is also uh, key to your work. I don't know if you wanted to just uh, the the, the uh, few minutes left here wanted to to sh say a few words about why uh, why would you focus on youth involvement to reach the sustainable development goals? And would you give an example of this particular work? Sustainable cities, sustainable areas, they have to include all groups, uh, also the uh, disadvantaged and, and the uh, people under, under certain pressure. And there is research that shows that one group that is very often uh, disadvantaged is actually girls. They are less represented uh, in pu public space uh, in, in, in Europe here in Europe as well as in other parts of the world. And their needs are not considered and they, girls, young ladies, they have to nav navigate very, very carefully when they are uh, out moving, not only at, at nighttime, but, but always. And uh, these inequalities is something that the different uh, municipalities really have to work with. And, and the Global Utmaning have initiated a program together with uh, Botkyrka municipality, a suburb south of Stockholm, uh, financed and, and supported by Vinova, where we have, under a period of, of nearly two years, connected mm -hmm. girls uh, in, in the age group somewhere between 16 and, and 25, uh, together with all the actors which are important for them. 
Mm. The municipality and the transport and the housing estates and, and, and all those. And over a long process with, with workshops that have uh, innovative kind of labs, mm -hmm. which has been, and this is important then because they have been positioned at a time when these are when these ladies are available mm. and at places where they can actually go because okay. very so often it's... participatory processes fail on, on small details mm. and these girls have been looked upon as the experts and all the other people have then uh, together with them interactively found solutions to the problems that they need and and then what we are doing presently is that as a second phase we are creating a digital platform mm. goes into your phone uh, and you get a toolbox where other municipalities over the world can use the same system in order to create uh, an environment which is more adapted to the needs uh, of ladies. So you're and creating this... like a global network of knowledge here on how to engage with and listen to and, and actually implement uh, policies and practices that that's make the world a better place for girls. We hope so. I think and this, this is great. I'm sorry, will... I'm sorry, Thomas, that we're running out of time again. Mm -hmm. And as always, it's a super complex issue. But anyway, I encourage all of you in our audience who are interested to check out the Swedish Local Agenda 2030 Hub and the Global Utmaning. And you can also contact Thomas if you want to learn more. And, and we will follow up this also in a coming webinar series on the Agenda 2030 goals uh, with, uh, with Norregio. So we're looking forward to that as well. Thank you so much, Thomas, for contributing today. Uh, so uh, our next stop is in Denmark. Hello, Lotte Fast Karlsson. You are representing another Nordic network called the Nordic Safe Cities Network. And you work uh, very proactively with your member cities uh, against extremism and for uh, social inclusion. And you also focus a lot on youth and girls. So uh, Lotte, please tell us more about how you work with your members and, and these specific projects. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here and also for being the one representing uh, Denmark. I'm happy for that. But um, just a brief background of uh, who we are, Nordic Safe Cities. We we were initiated in 2015 after the terrorist attack here in Copenhagen and uh, was established to help cities prevent that such episode could ever happen again. Um, so in short, we have now 19 uh, Nordic cities that we work very closely with to prevent polarization and violent extremism. And we support the work in three different levels. Um, we engage the mayors to ensure that we have political commitment to create these safe cities. We also advise and help practitioners create a change for and also with their citizens. And then we also work very closely with the youth to empower them, to give them a voice to create more inclusive cities. So, so uh, I know one of your projects is called All In. So what does that mean in practice? And how do you actually reach out to uh, the young population or through your member cities then? I mean, what, what, which tools do you think are most important here? Well, I think actually, if I could just start by perhaps coming with some examples from around the Nordic region, I think we have so many good examples for how the, the cities actually work to include these young people with either promote youth activism, uh, also on engaging them more in the local democracy processes and also to inspire for co-creation as we actually just heard about in Arndale. Um, so if it's okay, I'll just give a few examples sure. of, of how that's Absolutely. been done. Um, because I think I, I really want to highlight one example in Helsinki where they've actually provided a 150,000 euros solely for the youth so that every year they can actually um, suggest and vote for how these money are being used only for the youth 
and uh, they, they call this uh, participatory budgeting. They also have it for the other members of the city, but I think it's a very good way to actually walk the talk on how you engage the youth and give them an opportunity to decide uh, how, how and how the money is actually being used in a city. Um, we've also seen in Frederikstad, a smaller uh, Norwegian city, where they've engaged youth democracy guides um, for up and towards the local elections. These guides actually walk out on the streets, they talk to the people, explain the importance of engaging in local democracies. And this is included in a race in the, participa uh, sorry, the participation at the elections, especially among the youth. And what, what if do you, you really want oh, sorry, uh, continue. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I just yeah, want no, to mention. Um, I, I'm just curious also how it, it must be quite hard, though, to find specifically more mar marginalized youth. Uh, would would, would uh, these cities work through the schools or how, how would they reach out beyond the most engaged youth? Yes, or the already yes, engaged exactly. youth? <laughs> No, I, I think a, a lot of cities have a lot of good ways of doing it. They actually, some of the cities actually have rules on how, who should be engaged in the youth councils. So it's not only the, the what do you call it, straight A's girls from schools, but also some of them that are more marginalis marginalized uh, that in, is engaged in that. Um, we also engaged in some of these uh, more workshops where you, we actually had some yeah, we invited young people from the more um, polarized areas, as well as, of course, young people from the schools to have a voice to engage them in some of the uh, in, in creating initiatives for the youth and with the youth in the cities. Um, that's what you also mentioned before. The all in project is all about. Mm -hmm. It's it's about giving the young people a voice um, inviting them in to give examples to exactly what they need to, to feel more included in the city, as well as to also uh, come up with ideas for activities mm -hmm. and so on. Are um, you, are you uh, involving all your member cities? Uh, is it part of the, the, the deal, so to speak, when you become a member of, of your network that you also start implementing this, uh, these specific initiatives? And is your network growing? Do you have more cities coming in? Uh, yes, we do have more cities coming in. I think uh, this is especially an agenda that is very uh, high on the uh, uh, awareness at the moment. So yes, we do have more members coming in. Um, we have all the capital cities as well, who is actually at the moment devoted to work more closely on youth engagement. Uh, with together with their mayors, actually they've pledged to 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 work uh, on engaging the young people, and also on an, another agenda which is more like digital literacy and 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 so on. So this is something that is definitely important for the cities. I I do believe that we are actually rather good at engaging young people in the Nordic region, um, but of course we can always be better at, at doing that. Um, and uh, this is not something that we require for uh, being part of this network, but it's, of course, something that we highlight mm. every time mm. we engage in, in activities. We should also engage the youth. Mm. Um, another example is, that, for instance, the transport uh, department in Stockholm. Every time they have new initiatives, they actually invite in the youth to have a voice mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. initiatives like that i think we should definitely work to spread that even more yeah. because it's yeah. a way to give the, the young people a voice thank you so much lotte for explaining a bit more about your work and and what it means in practice with youth involvement um, for others listening today uh, if you represent the city check in check out the uh, nordic safe city network uh, on our event page or online and and see if if you would like to join as well thank you so much so we're actually coming to the very uh, final last but not least part of today's session of norwegia forum and we've invited our own dear director, Mr. Shell Nilsson, uh, to uh, to uh, share his his uh, thoughts on key takeaways and also elaborate a little bit on next steps on Nordic collaboration on integration. Shell, you're very welcome to the program. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, yes, uh, 
two the first two words that showed up in the menti uh, survey regarding uh, the impression of this day was frustration and no simple solution <laughs> and i will start with uh, no simple solution because i think all the presentations and all these uh, interesting examples that uh, they have been focused quite a lot on refurbishment and physical transformation of the areas but it's important to uh, to emphasize really that uh, give, get, getting into or, or getting better integration and inclusion uh, also includes very highly social policy and it also includes criminal policy and that's actually the development that uh, Klaus Beck Danielson presented uh, how the 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 um, the uh, transformation of the housing areas has developed over time so that was um, the first and i mean a kind of a conclusion of the uh, uh, different methods when it comes to frustration my my comment is i'm definitely not frustrated i'm quite optimistic <laughs> because i think that uh, inclusion and integration is actually it's a necessity for our societies and that is uh, quite simple because our nordic welfare medal it builds on uh, people paying taxes and uh, in order to to get enough money from that system so to say you need to have enough people in the labor forces yeah. and that yeah. is uh, the future's biggest challenge I think for the Nordic societies is the relationship between the people in the working ages uh, and uh, especially elderly people mm. and um, so therefore uh, what we can see is a lack of labor force in the future and there of course all the immigrants is an important resource because they have an, another age structure Mm. But there is a big but in that, and that but is that they need to work and pay taxes instead of living on subsidies. Mm. And that is actually, we still have a difference when it comes to employment rates in all the Nordic countries, more or less, between natives and immigrants. That is about 20%. And that is not sustainable in the long run. And there, therefore, I mean, integration is a necessity. We, we need to fix this mm. in a, a good way. And I'm sure that by combining all the efforts and, and uh, within different policies, then it's possible. So that's... Uh, uh, and it will be... You also want to, me to say something about what happens next and so on. Uh, the next session of Norregio Forum... Uh, is about skills and, and uh, labor and workforces. Mm. And there we will go more deeply into mm. these uh, things amongst others when it comes to, to uh, the skills needed and so on mm. in order to, to get people integrated in the labor markets. And finally, uh, the new Nordic Cooperation Program on Regional Development and Planning there will be uh, a lot of focus actually we will work a lot more uh, also on what has been uh, presented in uh, in the mo uh, in the first hours today about area based solutions area based initiatives their effects uh, spreading good examples uh, hopefully also or maybe also establishing a network between uh, the municipalities which have experiences with this. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. building on some of the existing Nordic examples, yeah. perhaps, or at least in collaboration with these uh, existing yeah. Nordic city yeah. networks. Thank you so much, Shell.
Uh, our time is up for, for the forum today and uh, we really want to thank all our speakers and all of you in the audience who have sustained throughout these two and a half hours and, and leave you uh, with, uh, with this opportunity to meet and mingle with the speakers if you have time, another 15 or uh, 30 minutes, just use the Zoom link and join the Zoom meeting that follows right now actually and of course Tune in again on Monday for the final and third session of Norwegian Forum 2020. As Shell already mentioned, we'll focus on skills, matching and work workplaces for the future. So welcome back on Monday. Thank you so much for today. And thank you also Pipsa for handling all the questions and Menti and everything. Thank you, awesome. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye.